A land from the Arabian Nights, home of Sinbad the Sailor. Filled with secrets and magic, the kingdom of scents and colors. A land with many faces, diverse and surprising. As wild as it is peace-loving. A country that lives out its traditions and welcomes the modern age. Oman. Sunrise in the Orient. The call of the Muezzin awakens the Arab metropolis. The Sultanate of Oman is a coastal state on the Arabian Peninsula. It's nearly three times the size of England, but only has half the population of London. The capital city, Muscat, lies in a bay enclosed by rock face. Muscat is a flourishing metropolis. This is mainly thanks to the reigning sultan, Qaboos Ibn Said. The sultan was educated in Europe. Since taking over the rule of the country in 1970, he has been making efforts to modernize it. Prestigious buildings were erected for the education and spiritual well-being of his subjects. Oman's main mosque, carries the name of its ruler. It was designed by two architectural firms from London and built within six years. In the 50 meter high dome hangs one of the largest chandeliers in the world. Made by a German-Italian company, it has over 1,000 lamps and weighs almost eight tons. The enormous prayer rug was made in Iran. 600 weavers worked on it in shifts for three years. The male prayer hall offers space for over 6,000 believers. The mosque also has a public library. A cultural, educational and religious center very much in the spirit of the Sultan. The name of the capital, Muscat, roughly translates as place to anchor in Arabic. This is where the story of Sinbad the sailor was born. Sailing is still popular in Oman. Unlike in the times of Sinbad, women are now also at the helm. Like the ladies from Oman Sail, since it was founded in 2008, this women's team has won many regattas. In charge is the team's co-founder, Ibtisam Al-Salmi. I like everything about sailing. Yeah, it's a great adventure and good fun with your team. Everyone like improving, everyone trying to do their best. I have a great team here and we're all one, one hand. They're training for their next regatta. Especially in the regional competitions, their opponents are usually all-male crews. We're preparing for Sailing Arabia the Tour. It's one of the biggest races in the GCC countries, and it will be a really great idea and good opportunities for the women to, you know, sail in this race and 
like compete with the boys and beat them sometimes. <laughs> they have the speed. The small women's team can sail up to 70 kilometers an hour in the Gulf of Oman. Along the coast, a few kilometers south of Muscat, a piece of Omani wilderness has found a refuge. Here, the rare Arabian desert gazelles lead an unromantic existence between the motorway and new settlement buildings. The animals seem restless and tense. And no wonder with that traffic. At least they have their own bodyguards who are there to protect them from all harm. <laughs> Ali Al Ghadani is one of them. <laughs> Together with his colleagues at the reserve's ranger station, he tries to keep an eye on as many animals as possible. Like his father before him, he is entirely dedicated to the animal's protection. And unfortunately, this protection is urgently needed. We're dealing with hunting attempts in this nature reserve on an almost daily basis. A daily basis. However, we're arresting at least one hunter red-handed every two months. The reason why attempts have increased over the past years is the location of the reserve between two main roads, the Interior Expressway and the Coastal Road. These two roads give quick and easy access to the gazelles. In addition, hunters can easily watch the gazelles crossing or standing nearby these two roads. In general, we're experiencing countless hunting attempts in this reserve. However, with our team's efforts, we thank God that we've managed to seize many convicted hunters over the past years. The coastal road leads south to the entrance into the so-called Wadi Tiwi, a river valley that has not yet been developed. There was once an important trading port at the river's mouth. Some of the goods were transported from there high up into the Wadi Tiwi by donkey, bringing them to the peaks and lowland oases of this peninsula. It is one of the few river valleys in Oman that continues to carry water in the dry season. A valuable commodity in a desert state. And a safe habitat for the common gara fish, which dwell in almost every Arabian waterway. To supply even those gardens high up in the Wadi rock face with water, the locals have learnt how to irrigate. Countless small canals line the roads and run along the steep cliffs. In some areas, the water seems to flow freely. Elsewhere, it's channeled in canals and flows along the mountains like stone encased veins. These so-called fallage systems supply whole villages, gardens, or even individual plants with water. The date palm has always been one of the most important plants in the north of Oman. To ensure they receive the best care, some even have their own flower pots. The farmers bring painstakingly gathered goat dung, often from far away. It is an essential fertilizer, without which it would not be possible to farm these oases sustainably. 
plants take minerals away from the soil, which can only be replaced by the dung. But there is still a lot more work to be done in these gardens. The secrets of oasis gardening have been handed down by word of mouth for centuries, a wisdom that is now slowly being lost. For example, that these gardens are everything but a monoculture. The date palm towers over the other plants, protecting them from the searing sun. Wheat, maize, bananas, papaya, mango, and even cotton flourish in their shade. The older the tree gets, the higher it grows. Even though its owner, Amur Salim Asadi, has matured with his tree, it takes increasingly acrobatic feats to prune it. The quality of Omani dates is famed throughout the Middle East. This is especially because the gardeners tend to their trees with extreme care. Amur al-Sadi does not just remove the old leaves and excess bark. At certain times of the year, he frees up the palm's flower head and ensures it will be pollinated. Amur used to work alone, but he now has support from one of the migrant workers that make up almost half of the population of Oman. The date palm won't survive without all this management. The most important thing is the manual pollination, or the whole harvest will be damaged. How do you care for your date palms at home? Amur's colleague, Sohil Aboklahad, comes from Bangladesh. My family's in Bangladesh. I just got married five months ago. Children, yes. We're expecting a baby. I was in Bangladesh for four months before I returned back to my work in Oman. I only arrived here one month ago and my wife was still pregnant. Therefore, I don't have my family here with me. I only have my brother here working with me. The small river flows gently through the valley. It flows so calmly that the odd hiker may forget that it only takes a little rainfall in the mountains to turn it into a raging and deadly stream. This is why the small village of Mibam enjoys its sheltered location along the upper reaches of the river. It is the last village in the Wadi Tiwi that is only accessible by a narrow and difficult road. In a time of smartphones, this small world will probably become too restrictive for the younger generation. The road ends at the town's edge. Only the donkey trail leads higher up into the wadi. Until 40 years ago, for the people living on the Arabian Peninsula, this used to be the only path to the outside world. It leads from the sea high up into the Al-Hajar mountains, where traders would once transport their goods, only a few crows now circle. Sometimes they're joined by an Egyptian vulture, which looks down over the deserted ravines. From the Wadi Tiwi, goods were brought far into the northwest of the Al-Hajar Mountains, 
until the Middle Ages. Various different tribes had settled in the mountains. Their houses nestle snugly against the rocky walls. Some of the villages are still inhabited today, but there is neither electricity nor running water. The Sultanate has gained its wealth from its oil and gas reserves. The profits are going towards the building of modern housing in the valley. Some of the former residents still use their clay huts in the mountains, at least occasionally. One of them is the beekeeper Zokr al-Abri. This is where his bees continue to find their food. He drives into the old village at least once a week and goes along the narrow alleyways to his colonies. Al-Abri's bees live in modern hives made from wood. He used to keep them in the hollowed out trunks of felled date palms. The Arabic word for bee, nakhlad, means God's gift, and that is exactly how the bees are treated. The agricultural authorities take great care to preserve the so-called Omani dynasty bee colonies. Just last year, the export of queen bees was prohibited. They are to reign only in their native land. As a matter of fact, honeybees have three seasons per year. The first season is in March, which is a general flower season. The second season is in May, which is the season of acacia flower. And the third is Az-Zadr, the Zisifa season, which almost starts in October. Omani honeybees are not aggressive, and therefore you can open an active beehive without wearing a mask. They're characterized by their small size compared to other varieties such as the Egyptian bees, which are much bigger and more aggressive. Sokr al-Abri has to check on his colonies regularly. For even in the Omani mountains, bees are not immune to pests. Luckily, he has the right medicine. Whenever necessary, he prepares a herbal treatment for them. This can help in controlling varroa disease by fumigation. We use the resin of this tree, Google, which is available in our village, Misfat al-Abriyin. We also use thyme, which has a strong smell, similar to green tea. We mix these two plants and burn them inside the smoker to treat and control varroa disease. This treatment is very effective for the disease and we use it regularly. When Al-Abri's work is done, he will return to the valley, where he, like so many of his fellow villagers, has a large new house to call his own. One of the Sultan's declared goals is to inject money from the oil business into modernizing infrastructure, the health system and education. Upon entering adulthood, every citizen is given a plot of land. In addition, the kingdom supports any home construction with a generous sum of cash. But even if people are now living in smart villas, they are far from giving up their traditions. Even in the modern settlements, goats are kept and traditional craftsmanship is upheld. Until a few years ago, Saif al-Abri and his family lived in Wadi in the mountains and worked as a weaver. A landslide blocked the only access way to his village. He gave up everything 
and moved here. He continues to weave in the garage of his new home. He still uses the same loom and employs the same technique. Not even the materials have changed. He only uses pure goat hair that he buys directly from the shepherds in the mountains. The colors are natural and there's no need for chemical additives. You can make three colors from the white wool. I mean the orange and red colors. You should boil the white wool yarn for three hours with the dye to get these colors. The traditional carpets are very popular. Even more is wall decoration than carpets or to sit on. The weaving craft has been in the family for many generations. And not just the skill itself, but also the tools of the trade. This piece is from olive wood. We've used it for more than 65 years and learned to weave with it. I learned more than 30 years ago. We start with collecting sheep wool, then sorting, carding and combing it before we start spinning the wool into yarn. After that, we wash the yarn, dye it and add mordant fixatives before we use it for weaving. Whilst many things remain the same, other things are also changing for the weaver. Nowadays, things aren't like they were before. We've been approached by many customers, some Omanis, but many tourists. We'll do everything to preserve this craft, because we've learnt it from our ancestors and we have to pass it on to our descendants. It's our duty to preserve our cultural heritage. Because the carpets are woven by hand and take several weeks to make, they can have a high price label, especially for tourists. Ensuring the weaving handcraft in this country as a job with a future. The highest point in the country is in the Al-Hajar Mountains, the so-called Jebel Shams. It is considered one of the most beautiful places for the Omani sunset. Deep in the belly of the mountains, there is darkness. A fairyland in itself is the Al Huta stalactite cave. Once night falls, the mouse tailed bats begin to stir. Soon they will go out and hunt for food. The Al Huta cave is over two million years old and almost five kilometers deep into the mountain. In the so-called large fish lake, deep inside the Al Huta live gara fish that are white and have no eyes. The fish are common in waters outside the cave. There they are colorful and can see. Before sunrise, Something is going on in the mountains. A clandestine meeting, perhaps, in an abandoned mountain village. Along the narrow alleyways of Misfat al-Abrin, slippery stone steps that have been worn bare 
lead down to the center of the village. A light is already on in one of the clay huts. The mystery is solved. Breakfast is being served. It was prepared far down in the valley, in the modern kitchens. It is for Misfat al-Abrin's new inhabitants, tourists. <laughs> Ahmed al-Abri has turned his old village into a hotel. He couldn't bear the thought of letting his childhood home fall into decay. He convinced his family and then his neighbors. Actually, we don't have a kitchen here in the, in the house. And the food comes from the families because our vision to involve the locals as much as we can. So one of the things, uh, we bought the food from the locals. It's made by the, by the people, Om Omani people because we involve as much as we can the, the locals, not only in the purchase in the food, not in the other business, in the other services. So it's, I, can, I cannot say it's my own business or project. It's like a fami big family project. This hotel offers visitors from all over the world the chance to sleep like an Omani, in accommodation away from the modern guest houses. And so the little mountain village is undergoing a revival. Using the huts as guest houses has an added side benefit. The village's oasis gardens continue to be maintained and preserved. As are the centuries-old irrigation structures, the fallage system. It's considered to be highly complicated and can only be used by experts. The so-called wakir, the water master, monitors the water flow, as each plot can only be flooded for a certain amount of time. The water's source is high up in the mountains. Only once a week is it channeled to Misfat. When the wakir closes off a tributary, the water finds another direction within the artificially created barrages and open canals. The irrigation system is thought to have been brought to Oman by the Persians around 600 BC. Parts of it were designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2006, such as the Falaj Daris, the largest irrigation channel in Oman. It supplies the oasis city Nizwa. Nizwa lies along the southern edge of the Al Hajar Mountains. Around 70,000 people live here. The city is well known for its Friday goat market. Animal breeders come from across the region to get the best prices for their livestock. The goats are presented in a circular arena in the middle of the market the market version of a catwalk. If an agreement is reached, a sale is sealed with a handshake 
as well as a payment. It's like an auction, looking at the size, and whether it has meat or doesn't, and the type as well, if they're healthy or not. There's no fooling the experts. You can see by the way when they're walking and the, the height of it. This is, you can see it's healthy. And uh, also some people looking for the teeth. If they're still there, so it's uh, young. Uh, and it's all their teeth start to uh, fall down. The goats have no choice. They're grabbed and groped and put through their paces. And may well be rejected at the end of it all. A quality feature is their origin. The best specimens supposedly come from the mountains to the southwest of Nizwa. In the small village of Halut, on the upper end of the Wadi Tiwi Valley, they're herded out to pasture. The women in the village do this job. Every morning, they gather their animals from the various houses. They herd them to the best grazing areas in the mountains and up to the plateaus. The old men stay behind, and because there's no school on Fridays, the children are there too. <laughs> Just one of the men is also setting off. Today, it's Jamis al Mukahimi's turn to do the watering. The Umpkbir oasis, which was home to him and other members of the village until a few years ago, lies on the upper end of the Wadi Tiwi. It can only be reached by donkey. It seems that neither of them are particularly eager to make the difficult journey to the work that awaits them. Because no one has anything to do on a Friday, the Islamic Sunday, the spectacle unfolds in front of an audience. Mr. Mugahimi has no idea that today a surprise is waiting for him. Up in the mountains, the Wadi Tiwi seems too narrow even for a donkey track. Between the gorges, the Umpkbir oasis opens up. Up until a few years ago, people lived here throughout the year. The irrigation system is only set in motion every two days. Jamis Al Mukahimi has been doing this work for decades. He spent most of his life here and seen a lot. An echo announces visitors. The scientists Mohammed Al Rawahi, Andreas Birkett, and Eva Schlecht have brought a present for the oasis farmer. He and the professors from Germany have enjoyed a long friendship. The agricultural ecologists have been researching oasis cultivation for a long time. Their publications can even be found in the libraries of Oman. The researchers discovered that plants, once brought here over the old trade routes, were still being cultivated today. They consider the desert gardens to be genetic treasure troves. Which is why the present is more of a returning of a borrowed item. 
the oasis banana of Oman. An offshoot from the botanical garden of the University of Kassel. Burkert discovered the plant, one of the last of its species, over 10 years ago in Mukahami's oasis and was allowed to take it away for research. Testing in the laboratories in Germany showed that this banana was resistant to pests and fungi that our common banana was not. It probably came here hundreds of years ago with traveling traders. Today, it has become extinct everywhere else in the world and has only survived in this oasis. I met them up there near the village and then took them to where we grow the bananas. I helped them to take some plant samples and then accompanied them back to the village. Understanding Omani oases and preserving them despite the ongoing rural exodus is an important issue for the scientists. But first, it's time for the country's typical hospitality, with halva made from homegrown dates and spiced coffee. The Omani oasis banana has meanwhile made a career for itself. And the banana now is both in the botanic garden in Muscat, but also it is in the world's collection of banana because it's a heritage of humanity, mm -hmm. originally coming from Malaysia, from the Philippines, through Omani sailors, possibly mm -hmm. through India or through Zanzibar, mm -hmm. and then arriving at TV and then coming yes. here. And wow. you and your families, they have cultivated <coughs> it for hundreds of years. So we're very thankful to bring back some of what you have given to the world. Alhamdulillah. Right. Thanks to the maritime trading with goods from all over the world, Oman has been a wealthy and influential country for a long time. The boats for transporting the goods were made south of the mouth of the Wadi Tiwi in Sur. Already in the 6th century, the city was the central hub for the trade with East Africa. Legends claim that once upon a time, Sinbad's ships were built here, in the shipyards of Sur. The boats that are built here are called dows, a collective term that in these latitudes covers almost 60 types of ship. Even in Sur, it is now the Indian migrant workers who actually build the ships. It's extremely tough work. The hull is made from soft cedar or acacia wood, while robust teak wood is used for the keel and planks. This business has been in the hands of the Omani for many generations. Khaled bin Juma bin Hasum al Oremi is the owner's son and manages the business. We have almost 15 workers working under our supervision. Four of them are currently on vacation. The estimated time to build one traditional wooden ship is almost eight months. Actually, it takes around seven to eight months to build such a ship. This ship under construction belongs to people from Qatar and they will use it for tourism purposes in Qatar. Every year we have at least one order to build one or two ships for customers from Qatar. Depending on the features, the wooden gems can cost up to 200,000 Omani Rial, around 500,000 euros. The shipbuilders buy the acacia and cedar wood here in Oman. The teak is imported from Malaysia, India, Burma and South Africa. There is no template. Every dow that is made here is unique. This is the only shipping yard in the Middle East that still makes dows by hand, just as in Simbad's times. 
We inherited this profession a long time ago from our parents and grandparents. For example, my father and his father were all working in the shipbuilding industry, and we will continue. We'll bring our children here and teach them this profession. The Dows have shaped Sur. The city has an almost Mediterranean feel to it, perhaps due to the steady international influence that it's gained from the traveling traders. Sur has a turbulent history. In the 16th century, it was under Portuguese rule. 100 years later, it was freed and enjoyed a rebirth. But with the opening of the Suez Canal in the 19th century, the trading port finally sank into insignificance. Nowadays, it's considered as one of the most beautiful cities in Oman, with a high quality of life. Constructions such as the Khor al Bata hanging bridge are a testament to the city's modernization. Yet much of Sur still revolves around shipbuilding. Like the Fatar al Qair, an Omani captain saw this historic Dao in Yemen and brought it home to Oman, where it was painstakingly restored. Sur is the most eastern city in Arabia, the first to glance at the sunrise and now home to a large natural gas liquefaction plant. Many of Sur's 100,000 inhabitants work there. At least for now, natural gas is bringing wealth and influence back to this coastal town. If one travels inland from Sur, there is only desert. Even before sunrise, there is something moving between the dunes. Moments ago, there was dark nothing. A race is now being prepared. The small robots on the camel's backs have replaced children who used to serve as jockeys until just a few years ago. Using all their strength, the men set up the seemingly archaic starting device. The racing camels and their robot jockeys are at the starting line. And they're off. Men in the cars try to get the animals going with loud noises and wild threats. As desert creatures, camels are born to conserve energy. It takes a lot of motivation to get these animals to suddenly perform sporting feats. That's what the remote control whip function in the small robots is for. The robots sit more securely in the saddle than children, who would often hurt themselves, sometimes fatally, in the chaos that is camel racing. As once the animals have got moving, they're almost unstoppable. These early morning races are showdowns of strength. 
both for the camels and for the cars. After the sun has risen, it quickly becomes too hot. In the start positions once again. A last wild race between man and beast. Three quarters of Oman's surface area is rock, scree, and sandy desert. The Shakia sands lie to the west of Sur. It is a formidable dune landscape, stretching south for 12,000 square kilometers. The desert expanse is so extensive it can clearly be seen by satellite. This is where the Bedouins live, the nomads of the desert. Camels were once vital for their survival. Milk, food and transport all depended on these animals. And although Bedouins now live in air-conditioned houses and get around in four-wheel drives, they will not give up their camels. Take Abdullah al mughairi and his brothers. They are dedicated to caring for their animals, even if that means the regular removal of giant ticks. Always. Not very heavy, relaxing. Same the mosquito, you know? Hard for the body. Nothing is too much for their camels. Take them doctor sometime, take them shower, sometimes take them a nice uh, drink, vitamin C, honey and uh, oil from the cow mixed together, milk, sometimes some tablet also. They eat uh, dates and grass, alpha alpha. The camel also, now with the, the, the time you have a baby, also maybe drink uh, milk from the camel and drink very healthy milk. Sometimes meat also good, not my camel, from the shop. Abdullah al mughairis family have been living in the Shakia desert for many generations. It was formed about two million years ago. Hot southwestern monsoon winds and shamal sandstorms from the northwest have formed these dunes. Some reach 200 meters high. The beauty of the Shakia keeps the Al Mugaidi brothers here. They have academic qualifications, houses and cars. Nevertheless, many years ago, they decided they would continue to earn their money in the desert. They offer camel tours. Rajid al mughairi the eldest, manages the business from his office in Muscat. But he comes out to the desert whenever he can. We organize our camel here to put the saddle there to be nicely done, not to hurt them. And this how was in the past. What was the camel? It's very important for the Bedouin, and not only for the Bedouin, for one because there was no car this time, and they've been traveling with the camel, and this is the best friend of the Bedouin.
This age-old connection is still there today. Even if they no longer travel long distances, they do give insight into a once deprived everyday life, lonely and in close touch with nature. And not least, it is a way for the Bedouins to preserve a part of their traditional way of life. The Bedouin, when they will travel normally after long, they are traveling with a camel or whatever, they will start to collect wood and they will start the fire. And here, what we're making here, Omani coffee. But the coffee will be without any sugar, because still we have the sugar from the dates. This is why we'll start with the, with the tamar first. And we'll eat the dates, and later we'll get the coffee. And this there must be any time, any house ready, any time. This is the first welcome. I am now between desert and city because of our business here. And actually I miss it. And we love the desert. It's home for us. 